Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. Throughout my career working in both mainstream and cutting edge new thought arenas of the media, I've encountered a number of gifted people whose pioneering work is advancing our understanding of human potential and evolution. And then there are those few individuals who play so far out at the edge where science and spirituality meet that you find yourself wondering, who is this person? What planet do they come from? How do they do what they do and what can we learn from them? Today's guest, in my experience, is one of that smaller handful of people whose dedication, determination and extraordinary willingness to go beyond the beyond opens up entirely new horizons for humanity to explore. Susie Miller is a visionary speaker, author, multidimensional seer and embodiment integration facilitator who pioneered a shift in the perception of autism from an individual disorder to a collective revolution in human consciousness. A former paediatric speech language pathologist with a master's degree in education, she's the founder of the groundbreaking Awesomism Practitioner Process, the Journey Back to Love series and Avatar Energetics. Now, having worked out on the edge in the arena of autism and the multidimensional abilities of the autistic population for two decades, Susie Miller has witnessed and participated in several extraordinary experiences with those on the spectrum. And along the way, she's been guided, informed and trained in advanced energetic processes by the collective consciousness of the children, the CCC, as she refers to them, who asked her early in the year 2000 to help shift the perception of autism. Susie Miller joins me today to divulge some of the predictions offered by the CCC over the past 19 years, many of which have since come to pass, and share what this unique collective has to say about such topics as higher dimensional realities, time space interference, what we don't know about this population, and what autism can tell us about the evolutionary trajectory of humankind. Susie Miller, welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, good to have you back on the show, Susie. Now, I know that that introduction may sound a bit far-fetched to some people, so I just want to establish a couple of important things right up front. First, when you first started speaking publicly about telepathy and multidimensional reality two decades ago, people thought you were crazy. 20 years yep. later, telepathy, <laughs> yeah, telepathy yep. is being recognized as a common skill among this population. And physics has demonstrated that multiple realities coexist within the same space. Now, at the same time, throughout that 20 year period, you've worked with professionals in a variety of fields, leading edge scientists, psychologists, social workers, educators, as well as metaphysicians, healers, and new thought leaders. And you twice collaborated with Dr. William Tiller, Professor Emeritus Stanford University, featured physicist in the movie, What the Bleep, with whom you spearheaded the autism intention healing experiment and, and that's just you know a small part of what you've done and achieved now having established your professional credentials let me ask you this do people still think you're crazy <laughs> I was just listening to that thinking oh my gosh maybe I'm not crazy this is good <laughs> yeah no it's you know in it you know it's I think that I was just talking to somebody before the call tonight about that and you know it's our none of our experiences are crazy i think that that's a really important thing to wrap our heads around that you know there are all kinds of things that that um there are all kinds of things that people experience in this world and some of them make sense and some of them don't but i think that when we really do pay attention to what our experiences actually are 
and trust that as our experiences that they have the potential to develop into something that's really not just important for us as individuals, but it can be very important for the collective too. Um, so yeah, I, I know there's lots of people out there right now um, having unique experiences and especially just where we're going collectively right now. So I just wanted to get that out before um, I said anything else. Trust, trust your experiences. They're leading you somewhere. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Well, you've, you know, we've we've spoken before on air about your background and how you switched from that very uh, grounded um, occupation that you had um, and um, moved into the spiritual arena and then all hell broke loose um, for many people. But um, <laughs> what I really want to talk about tonight is something that you haven't spoken publicly about um, a great deal and now you're beginning to and that is back in early 2000 the collective consciousness of the children as, uh, as you know they seem to be termed asked you to help shift the perception of autism now there are many people who've been channeling many beings entities energies whatever you want to call them intelligences um, Tell us a little bit about the collective consciousness of the children and why they asked you to shift the perception of autism. Yeah, um, that came about really naturally and organically. When I, you know, had my big shift back in 99 at the hands of a child diagnosed with autism, what, um, what happened right from the get-go is that, you know, this individual was... Um, was telepathic, being telepathic with me and sharing all kinds of information. And it, what ended up happening is one child after another or one individual on the spectrum after another started conversing with me telepathically. And at a certain point, it almost felt like I hit a tipping point so that maybe they were all talking to me or the, the consciousness, the collective consciousness of that experience were all talking to me simultaneously. So instead of making it about any individual child that was interacting with me telepathically, um, it was, it felt like it was coming more from this collective. And I would say that that collective consciousness of the children is made up of, um, the consciousness not just of those that are diagnosed with autism, but also those that are energetically sensitive, those that have had kind of childhood traumas, those that have had other kind of um, heightened sensory kinds of experiences or spiritual experiences. So all of that kind of gets lumped into what I'm calling the collective consciousness of the children. So you were asked to change the perception of autism and of course um, it shifted your perception of autism because you'd been working in a you know a completely different arena of speech language um, pathology with children right right yeah um, basically you know the what I heard initially was to shift the perception from autism to awesomeism to let people understand that what we perceive as autism is um, is far from limited. It's you know I was seeing it very differently, so they were basically asking me to share what I had come to know about this population, um, and in doing so, really helped to sh shift the paradigm of what it meant to be autistic, because I think most people hear that word and. They think, you know, lifelong, quote unquote, disorder um, that is, you know, riddled with limitations and challenges and, you know, kind of a lifetime of, you know, uh, suffering in a lot for a lot of people. That's how they hear it. But my experience of autism was truly that it was awesomeism. I mean, it was it was truly so much more than I had ever perceived um, this quote unquote condition um, to be or the way I was looking at it at that point. 
that yeah so they were just asking me to share and of course when you know you hear that from the collective consciousness of the children you go sure I'll share that information not even um, realizing that you know I'm still at that time wearing the hat of a speech language pathologist with a thriving private practice <laughs> you know <laughs> which you know you start talking about these things and you got people kind of thinking you have three heads and um, but but there was a there was a real fortitude in having this conversation with people because if I could go from being as clinically minded and educationally minded as I was to you know to seeing hearing and experiencing this population in the way that I was then I just have to assume that that others can make that shift as well and um, they weren't going to they weren't necessarily going to do it if I didn't share my voice in it. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I did. I just want to make it clear to anyone listening that, you know, this if you think this is just about autism, you're wrong because this isn't just about autism. This is about all of us. This is about humanity and, you know, where humanity is heading and the gifts that actually are ours that we have yet to acknowledge and experience. Right, Susie? Absolutely. I mean, so much of what this population has demonstrated to me, one, let me know that I, I have those skills as well. You know, it's you can't be telepathic with somebody who's telepathic unless you are as well. You can't see multidimensionally, you know, you can't, they can show you all kinds of things, but you have to be able to receive that and see that yourself in order to carry that out. So they were shifting me moment by moment from kind of very linear perception to multidimensional sight and telepathy and, um, yeah, the, um, teaching me how to integrate. It, you know, if they can do that for me, I'm assuming that they can, <laughs> they can do that for anyone. And I'm also assuming that these are all skills that we all we all have. These these are all buried skills. They're natural to us, and they're just helping us bring those back out to the surface. So what sort of things have you discovered within yourself that you didn't know were there before that the, the CCC, you know, has shown you? Well, I think it started with just some of the skill sets. Like I was just saying, it's like the, you know, to go from never having a telepathic experience in my life to having them over and over and over again um, at the hands of this population it's, um, you know, you realize that, that that skill is there. And not only is that skill there, but it doesn't have to be taught. You know, it's, it's not this linear process of teaching um, telepathy. Once this connection is made with this population, um, they, they have a way of popping this open within us. And... Um, and the same way with multidimensional sight, you know, it's like I had never really seen anything um, out of the ordinary before. Um, and then you're seeing, you know, light bodies floating um, above physical bodies and or, you know, pieces of information that exist in other realities that don't necessarily exist um, or not known in this physical reality, all of that just started to become available. And, and once it started to grow, it just kept continuing to grow and continues to grow to this day. So it's, it's, an, it's an unraveling process, right? It's a, it's a revealing process. And like I said, it's like once you have these experiences, you can't go back. You know, once you see autism as awesomeism, I couldn't go back to seeing this population as limited or through the eyes of medicine and education and science and those kinds of things. I, I, I had to see it from that multidimensional perspective. And interestingly enough, you know, I'm seeing that back in 99 and that's continued to grow since then. And now we do finally have the scientists starting to catch up. 
and saying, oh yeah, it's like we can now prove that those diagnosed on the spectrum have a greater propensity to be telepathic than some other populations. But to me, that makes perfect sense. You know, it's like you take a, if, if somebody's blind, some of their other senses become more, um, more in the forefront, right? They, they, they're um, heightened. So in this case, with autism, there I always kind of consider them multidimensionally heightened. Um, they, they have access to all kinds of information that the neurotypical human being just does not have access to. And it makes it extremely challenging for them to function in this reality. But there are also all kinds of realities where they're functioning beautifully. And that's when we understand that, when we really begin to know that, then we start tapping into that so that we can see that for ourselves. Yeah. Why, why has the diagnosis, the incidence of the diagnosis of autism um, rocketed so much over that 20 year period? Well, again, if we're speaking multidimensionally, it depends on what reality we really want to look at that from. So if I look at it from the broadest reality or what I would say like the soul level reality, then what the collective consciousness of the children told me was that back in the 70s, 80s, 1970s, 1980s, there was a collective call that went out from humanity. And that call was basically saying, hey, we're really, you know, kind of going in a direction that we don't want to go in anymore, and we need another kind of human. We need a, um, we need another kind of human being to start embodying here so that we can start making some shifts. And so, and at the time, you know, if you go back into the 60s, 70s, 80s, you have a population that is highly patriarchal in nature. And um, anything intuitive at that time was, you know, you know, maybe in the 60s or 70s, it was related to kind of, you know, some drug-induced <laughs> situation. And so it was kind of written off to that. But anything that was presented as highly intuitive or kind of otherworldly kinds of experiences, those were kind of, you know, kind of poo pooed by science and by education and still to a certain degree are to this day. But collective humanity, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Hold that thought, Susie. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. Sure. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. My guest today is visionary speaker, author, multidimensional seer, and embodiment integration facilitator, Susie Miller, whose pioneering work has effected a shift in the perception of autism from an individual disorder to a collective revolution in human consciousness. After the break, channeling the collective consciousness of the children, higher dimensional reality. The future of internet radio is here. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Namaste friends, this is Deva Pramala Miten. And we want to let you know that we will be in America and Canada this May. We'll be coming with our Wings of Mantra World Tour, coming up the West Coast to Boulder, Santa Fe, Sedona, Scottsdale, Santa Barbara, L.A., Marin, Santa Cruz, San Jose, Escondido, Edmonds, and up to Canada to Victoria and Vancouver. You can find details on our website, devapramalmiten.com. Hope to see you there. Lots of love. Namaste. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. 
I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. I am Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family. And then, boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle you to America and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back. Susie Miller, before the break, you were telling us about a a new kind of human. I know you've talked about new human before now. If, If a number of beings are going to embody Um, in order to heed that call, why do they have to suffer so much? Because many of the children do suffer. It is very hard for them to be here. It's hard for them to operate within, you know, our physicality, our, you know, the whole construction of this world is not set up to support them. (laughs) It's so true. And I think that if you spoke to anybody who is consciously aware that they are here supporting collective humanity in any way, shape, or form, they would say the same thing. They would say it's it's far from easy. You know, people like the idea that um, that souls come here to be of support and that it's somehow a an easy road, but history tells us otherwise. And so this population, and this is why I'm, I see diagnosed on the spectrum. I mean, the very fact that they're walking around here um, and are doing actually as well as they're doing, given the information that they have access to on a moment by moment basis. I mean, really, if, if, just as an example, if all of a sudden your sensory system was opened to not only in in amplitude, but in but in information, like the amount of information that could flow through your physical senses, if all of a sudden that was just cranked up, and I asked you to walk through the world, I guarantee that it would be extremely challenging. You would look and feel and express exactly, if not more, um, challenged than they do. They're, they really are doing an amazing job at being here with the information that they have access to. That said, there are also all kinds of things that we're learning right now about our human condition that really do not serve an evolving humanity. So, you know, we've, um, we're, we're taking a look at all kinds of things in the areas of medicine and science and education, um, you know, even parent, uh, parenting uh, techniques and all this kind of thing. All these things are, have been under a microscope now for quite some time as this population has increased. And we're changing the dynamics of of who we are as an evolving humanity because these kids are here. We're taking a look at all kinds of things that, you know, for instance, uh, vaccines, you know, back in, you know, the early 90s, late 80s, when I got my master's degree, you know, there was there was no conversation there was no real conversation about vaccines and things like this. Um, now, you know, this is one of the things that the kids said way back um, in 99, um, you know, to, to pay attention to that, to look at that as a contributing factor. And I'm not saying that that's the only factor, 
But what I am saying is that there are certain aspects of our human environment that really are just not um, supportive, like you were saying, of an evolving humanity. You, I mean, you've seen all kinds of positive shifts with these children in communication, behaviours, parent-child relationships, you know, um, greatly enhanced degrees of presence. You've witnessed, you've said, expressions of wisdom beyond that which mm. many would consider possible. And these children have taken you into their worlds and providing you with awareness and methods that you share in your trainings. Can you give us some examples of the kinds of things that they've exposed you to that you've seen <laughs> that one, you know, probably have blown your mind, I imagine? Yeah, yeah. Um, really interesting things. I have seen um, situations. Oh, you're actually going to let me let me say this on air, aren't you? This is going to be fun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you really are going to we're going to push the envelope tonight. Yes, so one of the absolutely. one of the more one of the more recent experiences that I had um, that really also let me know that um, that the integration the greater the greater embodiment of this population was now possible is just within probably about the last year i was interacting with a young man i had gone to see his mother and a center that she was creating and we happened to be um you know had breakfast downtown we're sitting outside on the park bench and i was sitting on the park bench talking to his mother and um, this little boy, this young man was sitting, or he was walking around, he had his shirt up over his head and he's he's moving around doing what he does and through physical eyes, you know, looking fairly autistic, you know, looking at, like he was having those behaviors. And then all of a sudden he kind of came over and he took my hand for a second and as he took my hand, I immediately left sitting on the bench. I was no longer sitting on the bench. My consciousness was going through a doorway with him. And as I walked through that doorway with with him, he was showing me all of the art that he does. And in this physical world, he's quite the artist and he likes to share his energy and his expression of self through his art. And he likes to shift people, actually, through his art as well. But in this situation, I was actually in that realm with him. He kind of opened the door, if you'd say, to like a studio. And he was showing me his art. And But this time, I could see the energy in the art. I could see the frequencies in the art. I could see what was multidimensionally imprinted into that information. Um, and about the time that I was... I, my consciousness was very attentive to where he had positioned me or where he had invited me to. And at the same time, his mother, who I was sitting next to on the on the bench, was I could hear her saying my name, Susie, you know, Susie, <laughs> what's going on? And he, in this other realm, said to me, my mother needs you, tell her what we're doing. And so I Next thing I knew, I was in my body, sitting on the bench, saying to her, this is what's happening. I'm with your son. I'll be back in a... And, and that played out for a matter of moments. And then I was back and was able to have that conversation with her and let her know what had happened. Hopefully, thank goodness, she's very open <laughs> and she was able to hear those kinds of, hear that experience. But I've had one kid after another actually take me into their world and um, teach me different things. They used to, it used to be that when I would telepathically communicate with them, they would just give me information um, multidimensionally and they would give me the information that would help or support their integration. And then just within the last year now, instead of just telling me that information, it's almost like they're taking me to that information. They're, they're taking me to that other reality where that information is solid, I guess is the best way I can say it. Now, you've said that 
they have a unique relationship to time and space. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not one that, you know, we can really understand from our perspective. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, this one's, um, I think this one is so tricky for neurotypical individuals to wrap their heads around because we're all so programmed into a, a linear relationship with time. So we've, you know, past, present, future. And this population just simply does not experience time in that way. They are what I would call more cyclical learners or, or they experience um, cyclically. And so we all actually, you know, we all um, understand this to a certain extent. So if I said to you, you know, we've, we've all had experiences where we've kind of gone around the same issue, right? So maybe like one of our core triggers, it comes back around and it comes back around and it comes back around. That's a, an example of cyclical learning. We'll, we'll, we'll rotate through that experience with new awareness every single time until we're done rotating through that experience, until we've got it, right? And then that particular experience dissipates or disappears. Well, those diagnosed on the spectrum are cyclical learners. And so they're also cyclical creators. So yes, they, they understand that they are going to cycle through different experiences until they get that experience and then they're going to move on to something else. And when we ask them to learn in a very linear way, when we even start talking to them about past and present and future, it, it, it just doesn't compute in all kinds of ways. And every single time that we are kind of hell-bent on the fact that, no, this happened in the past, or no, this is going to happen in the future, or don't you know what time it is? We need to, you know, we need to be on the road in 15 minutes. Why aren't you, you know, part of, part of the challenge for them is that all of those timelines, all of that information exists at the same time. It it. It exists in a kind of a swirling cyclical fashion. And so if you really want them to place their attention in linear time, you're going to have to give them something more than your words in order to have their focus be on that particular timeline in that particular moment. Um, if you don't, they're just, they're swirling all over the place. This also plays out in our education system, you know, when we want the kid to come through the door, we want them to do this math first and then English and then whatever. Um, it really doesn't work for this population and we really don't get to see the full extent of who they are. What will happen more likely for this population is they come in with a particular um, interest or a particular focus and they will hold on to that particular focus whatever it is um, until they kind of unravel it or until they fully create it and if that means that they need, need a little bit of this or a little bit of that from some outside support they will they will draw that to them. They will call that in to them. But when we're kind of cramming down their throats, this whole idea that um, they need to learn everything, you know, kind of to be a well-rounded human being or whatever we believe, um, you know, why ever we believe we're educating the way we're educating, this population just kind of goes, I don't know what to do with that because they know on some level, they know what they're here for. And as soon as our job is to find out what that is and to support that, and then they'll go through all the learning cycles, they'll go through all of the creation cycles to, um, to bring that to fruition, but they're not going to do it in some linear fashion. Um, yeah, it makes so it what really are the challenging benefits for educators. That? I mean, well, if the benefits, this is something that, that we're evolving into, what are the benefits mm -hmm. to us, you know, from well, being yeah, more like that? I mean, 
Right. Well, think about the fact that if if every single one of us knew when we got here that there was a particular interest, a particular focus, even if it was a general focus, I'm generally interested in astronomy or I'm de- I'm generally interested in mathematics or what whatever these uh, these topics are if we knew that then we would we would jump right into that with if, if we could articulate that or share that or offer that to those around us then they could start supporting us from the from the get-go as to you know really what we want to express and be in the world and the challenge here is that that these individuals do know what that primary interest is, but there's still a vibrational mismatch between themselves and their parents, their themselves and their educators. So it's like one's trying to say, hey, I'm only interested in this. And the other one is saying, well, we want you to be interested in all of these things so that you'll be a well-rounded individual. What we, what we're attempting to and what awesomeism and the practitioner process and everything has attempted to do is bring those two viewpoints into greater harmony so that that conversation can actually be had regardless of whether that child is verbal, nonverbal, using facilitated communication or something else. So back to your question, the, the benefit is that when we actually can know what what somebody is really interested in and what is going to support their path and their process, then we can move them and support them in that um, according to their desires. And more often than not, they they'll they're going to expand us um, in those arenas as well. Does that make sense? It does make sense. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with visionary speaker, multidimensional seer, and author of the book, Awesomeism, A New Way to Understand the Diagnosis of Autism, Susie Miller. We're talking about what autism can tell us about the evolutionary trajectory of humankind. And we'll be back with more after this break. The cutting edge of conscious radio, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Om Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Om Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Susan Miller, you say that those on the spectrum experience the world from a morphological perspective or through fields of evolution rather than biological. What does that mean? Good question. I'm still trying to figure it out completely. But what I, what the collective consciousness of the children said um, was that they were they were morphological, not simply biological. And when I asked them about that, 
they shared that they are receiving information through fields of consciousness or so let me put it this way your emotional body is a field of energy your mental body is a field of energy your physicality is a field of energy and each each one of those fields Susie, are you with us? Well, it seems as though we've lost Susie for a moment or two. I'm hoping she'll be back straight away. So um, let's see if we can get Susie back. Susie, are you with us? We've completely when lost. When supplement. Susie. Do we lose? Susie, I'm sorry. We can... We completely lost you there. So we didn't hear most hear of that now? at all. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not sure where I was. So. Well, um, we didn't hear any of it. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Cool. So morphological, not biological. And so this population um, re receives information through so your emotional body, your mental body, your physical body, these are all fields of energy. This population is privy to that information. And we also know that anything that we are present to or put our focus on, we alter or we change. So let's, I'll give a really practical example. Um, when the kids said that they were morphological, not simply biological, they also said that this is why that anything that we, any way in which we try to support them that is coming strictly from a biological mindset or a biological perspective is not going to do the trick, so to speak, to support their full embodiment. Um, because every um, everything that is offered to this population is altered by the population. So have you ever heard a mother um, of a child on the spectrum say, well, I tried this diet for a while and it worked and then it didn't work. I tried this, these supplements, they worked and then they didn't work. I tried this. So what happens is the the child will take in as much of the information as it well it sounds like we're having real problems with Susie and her connection tonight um, often happens when we've got high energy beings which is still on the line but we just can't hear her at the moment um, so hopefully she'll be back in a few seconds um, for those of you who don't know about Susie's work, her book, Awesomeism, A New Way to Understand the Diagnosis of Autism, tells the backstory and some of the extraordinary experiences. Susie, yeah. we yes. lost you again. <laughs> I don't know why we keep losing you. You did text me and say that there are many, many kids with you right now, multidimensionally. Maybe that's got something to do with it. But um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat it again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. You can hear me now? Okay, cool. Yes. I just want to make sure. <laughs> so one more time. It's like I, I'm, I'm fine-tuning it each time, Sandy, so there must be <laughs> helping me through with this one. So morphological versus biological, what the kids had said was that when, if we treat them or try to support them, with something that is simply from a biological perspective, that it won't, it won't, it'll only support them to a certain degree because they are morphing or changing. Um, they'll take in information as much as they can take it in, but when, when it is no longer supportive to them, they will morph that energy. They will shift that energy. There's also a whole field of study 
within morphological science that says that two completely different species can look identical on the outside. They can both look human. They can both, you know, look like whatever they look like. But, but because of the way they're made up, because of the information that they take in and the reality they experience, they experience life almost like a different species altogether. And one of the things that the collective consciousness of the children said a long time ago in the early 2000s was that at some point they would come to realize that they were experiencing this reality um, differently to such an extent that they would be almost perceived as a different um, as a different human species. species, truly an evolution of our human species. Okay, so I think I can grasp that. Here's what I don't understand. If, if they are demonstrating to us um, the abilities that we all have access to and the potential of the human race, uh, evolutionary p potential, um, I can understand that, I, that knowing that can help us support the ones that are here now better. But how... Mm -hmm. How, you know, beyond that, what is the use of us knowing that if we're not there yet? I mean, it just becomes a <laughs> carrot, doesn't it, on the end of a stick? <laughs> you got it. And that's a very big <laughs> carrot. Um, so one of the other things that is really important to understand is that this population has said over and over again that those, especially parents of those diagnosed with autism, have really chosen to fast track their evolution, provided that they will take the opportunities that are presented to them. And so it is a big carrot. And, and in all honesty, it only takes, at least in my experience, it only took, you know, seeing something a little bit differently or hearing something a little bit differently to start following that carrot. And I can tell you unequivocally that if you follow that carrot, you will you will grow and know yourself as much more than you perceive yourself to be. They're they're constantly that's I think that's one of the the beauties of this population. I also think it's why the that a lot of this population is nonverbal or has communication challenges um, in the, at least the neurotypical fashion. I mean, you only have to put a nonverbal child or a child that's having challenges communicating in front of a parent, and that parent is going to open up in any way they possibly can to make a connection to that child. And so that's a very big um, impetus to start developing your own um, higher dimensional communication skills. And, you know, with all the practitioners that I've worked with over the years, what I know is that if you put those practitioners in the correct environment and you connect them with this population, they in, they do indeed become telepathic. And pretty quickly, um, we just create the right, you know, environment for that. But yeah, it's, it's a big carrot, but it's a carrot toward our own evolution, if we'll take it. Mm. Yeah. Now, back in 2008, the CCC asked you to help make connections between those on the spectrum and those that cared for them. And um, especially, you know, expanding what it means to communicate. You then launched the awesomeism practitioner processes that you were helping, uh, working with parents, working with all kinds of people who were interested in, um, in this arena. And you've now got many hundreds of practitioners around the world. You stepped back from that for a little while, for a few years. And then this year, you suddenly have launched a new autism integration series. And you're talking about, you know, helping people understand the energetics and the science behind integration. Why, why now, why all of a sudden is this new iteration um, coming forth? Yeah, well, for two reasons. One reason is that 
from the beginning of my process with this population, I could only facilitate what I myself had integrated. So um, they would give me an experience and I had to integrate that. And once I integrated it, then I could offer it. So it took many years to integrate my telepathic communications with them in a way that I could actually artic articulate that clearly and maybe even a little bit scientifically where I could find the science to, to meet it. I would say within about the last year, um, 2016 started, but within the last year, I went through another deep integration process, and um, and I would call this almost like more like an embodiment process, where a lot of the information that they've taught me over the years, it's like you start to become it instead of just talk about it. And they also said at the beginning of January that collective humanity had kind of bumped up over the edge, you know, over the, um, they kind of bumped up in frequency enough so that a lot of these individuals could really start to integrate and embody in ways that they hadn't been able to before. And that I should do it one more time and go find those people who were ready to um, play in that particular arena and kind of set the template for that. So that's what I'm doing. Now, I know that for the first time ever, you're actually offering this training um, out there in a public arena at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York um, in July, I think it is. That's something you've never done before. You've always worked, uh, you know, in a different way. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about that before we close. But here's, here's my big question for you. I said at the beginning that you're one of the few people I've come across, if not the only one, who's been so willing to go beyond the beyond. Um, 20 years is an awful long time to be so steeped in this work, to have to learn to integrate so much in order to be able to then help others. You know, that's a lot of people would balk at that. I mean, you know, I'll, get, I'll give you a couple of years and that's enough. Um, <laughs> what is it that keeps you going and makes you so dedicated to this? Well, there were definitely a few moments where I balked at it and said, okay, already, enough already. But but the truth is, is that when you when you see through my eyes, when you see some of the, the things that I'm exposed to, and when you get to hear... Um, what's coming down the pike and um, and also just watch the integration of some of these individuals when you watch their lives change. I mean, you can't help but kind of want to jump in and do it all over again. And in all honesty, it's like I was kind of waiting for this next piece to you know, to kind of fall into place. And I was hoping that there was another piece, but of course you just never know. Um, so I'm I'm really excited actually to be offering the um, Awesomeism the Autism Integration Series. Um, and by the way, there's I'm only taking 12 people in this series, and there's only there's three positions left. We start on Tuesday of next week. So if somebody's interested, email me, and I'll be happy to have a conversation with you about it. Um, but yeah, that's what keeps me going. I just um, I'm just amazed by the information that the collective consciousness of the children holds and keeps me going for a long time, for sure. <laughs> so, so you're not going to stop. So very quickly, tell us about the um, Omega Institute. How long uh, is that particular um, course mm -hmm. being taught there? Yep. So on July 7th through the 12th, so they're um, hosting me for five days and I get to talk about autism or awesomeism my way for those five days and the people that participate in that both come out with continuing education credits which is unheard of um, and wonderful and also um, come out as considered as an awesomeism practitioner so it's you know it's really it's guaranteed to open um, eyes to all kinds of different possibilities and potentials, um, also guaranteed to really make connections with the collective consciousness of the children and or 
um, personal children um, so that that dynamic, that communication can begin and people can start, you know, really having their journeys together. Well, we didn't get a chance tonight to talk about what's coming down the pike, but I know that you offer so much on your website. You have a lot of free things that you do. You also have your energy and integration series. And if anyone wants to know more, they will learn <laughs> what's coming down the pike <laughs> if they follow some of your work. Um, Susie Miller, thank you. Um, yeah, good luck with it all. I mean, I do admire your stick with itness. I really do. <laughs> that's um, that's that's admirable. Thank you for joining us, Susie. Thanks for having me. So you can find out more about Susie's work, um, her book, Awesomeism, A New Way to Understand the Diagnosis of Autism. You can learn about Avatar Energetics, the Autism Integration Series, the Children's Sanctuary, and the Journey Back to Love programs at susiemiller.com. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. Thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to being with you at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>